So um, one important thing that I think most people don't realize is how many people actually pass away without any estate planning in place at all. Um, that number is about 67% of people who pass away don't have anything put in place. So only out of a group of three people, only one of those people will have any documentation done at all. So that's kind of a big deal, I think, because... I mean, as much as people don't want to plan for their death, it's something that's going to happen to everyone. So it's something that, like, there's other areas of law, like divorce, stuff like that, that don't affect everyone. But estate planning and probate, they affect everyone because everyone ends up dying at some point. So um, it's kind of an important thing to plan for, but most people don't, I think, some of the issues that I've heard from people is they're worried about potential cost. They fear talking about their own death. I mean, most people don't want to discuss the fact that w you will pass away one day and what's going to happen to all of your stuff. But if you don't do anything, it can cause a nightmare for your family. And as this presentation is about, if you're unmarried, it can cause an even bigger nightmare for your partner and everyone involved if you don't do some sort of planning in place. Um, so if you have like a traditional family structure, which would be like husband and wife, they have children, all of their children are good kids, and they just want everything divided equally when they pass away, then state statutes may assist you with your estate plan being put out there and being done correctly without anything because there's intestate statutes, statutes for different states. Um, but I would say the vast majority of families that I've encountered, that's not the situation. It's either a, like a blended family, unmarried couples. Um, they might have a child that's kind of a bad apple that they don't want to get everything. And then another issue with um, that type of planning where you just let the state decide is that if you have a, like a minor child or a child that's say 18 or 19, the minor child, as soon as they hit 18, they would get their inheritance. And if you have a child that's 18, 19, 20, they would get their inheritance as soon as it went through the court. And I found this to be crazy, but I learned this at my uh, previous job. There was an AARP study done on how fast um, people spend their inheritance and the national average is under 60 days from the day they get the money till it's all gone. So that was kind of a shocking thing to me, but yeah, it was like 58 days roughly is how fast once they get the money. Now that didn't factor in if they spend it on like good things like paying off a mortgage or paying off a debt, but just in general, it doesn't even last two months for when someone gets the money. That's why estate planning and trust planning are very good tools to assist with that. And I've ran into a lot of families like that, the one probate and trust administration where the kids want the money as soon as someone passes their calling and wondering when they're going to get their cut of the money so that they can spend it. And they already have like a big truck or a fancy car picked out that they're going to spend the money on and they want that immediately. Um, I have noticed working in this area of law that I would say that the old saying that like nothing brings out the greed in someone until the death of a family member is really true because people really do fight over every little item, especially when the court gets involved. So for a complete estate plan, you would want to have a durable financial power of attorney, medical directives that includes a living will that lets your last wishes be known, and a healthcare power of attorney so that you select someone to make that decision if you can't, a HIPAA release form, a your last will and testament, a letter of instruction as discussed in the article that kind of has like your passwords, um, I know it talks about the location of a safe deposit box and it's key, 
but I personally don't like safe deposit boxes. They've caused a lot of headaches in my probate work. So if you have one, it, it might be something to kind of look out for is the safe deposit box. Then there's also a living trust. And that is a very important tool to prevent what I was just talking about, the spending everything in less than 60 days. So I think that the financial power of attorney is the most important document because whenever someone needs to use their financial power of attorney, likely the individual that they need to use it for is already incapacitated, has something going on to where they would not be able to legally sign one. So it's one of those that it's better to have it in place ahead of time than trying to get it frantically signed. And if you don't have one in place, something happens to you, your partner can't access your bank accounts or bank information to take care of business for you, then you're going to have to go through trying to get a guardianship through the courts. And I've represented some individuals doing that. And it is an absolute nightmare. It takes longer than your due date to get the bills turned in. Um, they poke and prod at a lot of your personal life and personal information. And in Ohio, where I'm located, if you have a family member who steps up and wants to do it in place of, say, your partner who you're not married to but living with, they will usually defer to the family member unless it can be proven that they're not fit to do the job. So a family member gets a lot of preferential treatment when it comes to guardianships. So it's something that turns into an absolute nightmare. Um, and it's just not an enjoyable process, but it can easily be avoided with, like I said, that financial power of attorney and then your medical directives as well. So your medical power of attorney, again, that's another important one. It only comes into play if you can't make a medical decision. And in that situation, again, you're probably incapacitated and unable to sign one at that time. So that's another big one that's important to have in place. And that one, again, would require a guardianship or some states have statutes that would allow them to just figure out who your closest family member is and contact them to make the medical decision. And I mean, if you're like, like myself, if I didn't have like my parents around and stuff and they had to contact like a cousin of mine instead of my girlfriend who I've been dating for five years to make a medical decision, that would not be, I don't think I would trust that person to make the correct decision for me. I would much rather have my significant other make that decision. The HIPAA release form, that's another kind of important and critical one to have. Not all estate planning firms offer that. I know we do here at Royal Legal, but that is going to be a form that allows individuals to talk to your doctor about medical information. They can't make a decision for you, but they can speak about medical information. Um, so that one, again, that would be important if you have a significant other, because if they want to be included in what's going on with you medically, they would not be allowed without that form. The doctor's not going to talk to them. I've even had situations here in Ohio where the doctor wouldn't talk to a spouse until we did those forms. So that one, even if you are married, it's still, that's a very important form. And you can include more than one person on that form, which is nice um, because the medical power of attorney it only has one person at a time. So you can have a successor, but you can only have one person acting at a time. So that's an important one. Then you got the last will and testament. Most people don't fully understand what this document is. Most people think I got a will, my estate plan's good to go. All a will is, is instructions for the probate court. So instead of if you pass away intestate, and they use the statutes to figure out where your property goes. With a will, they look at the will, 
the probate court does, and that determines how your property goes. The issue with that is it still goes to the probate court, which I know for like people that work with Royal Legal, a big deal is privacy. Well, if you go to the probate court, you don't have that privacy. So say you build up your portfolio and your business and you want to pass it on to your kids and leave a legacy. Well, they can't have that anonymity if it's going through the probate court because all someone has to do is look them up. And it's very easily to just look it up, figure out who has it, how much is there, and they can see all of that. It all has to go through public record and the probate court. Another issue with a will when you're including a partner is that since it's going through the court, family members, you have to have hearings at different levels or waivers signed. A family member can show up to the hearing and argue that you unduly influenced, um, you had some sort of reason for excluding them and getting yourself included. And if you do that, a judge is going to look at every all the facts, but it's very costly. It can be very expensive, very time consuming, um, involve multiple hearings and drag it out. And probate RA takes, when I would do probate administration, I would tell families best case scenario is six months, but I've had them last 24 months. I had one that lasted uh, 30 months total. So that's a big deal. And then if you have a portfolio and have real estate in different states, as a lot of real estate investors do, you would have to probate where you passed away. Then you'd have to probate each state and county where the real estate's located. So say I have some property down in like North Carolina, I would have to open a probate here in Ohio. And then I would have to open a probate in North Carolina just for that real estate. So then Probate, the attorney fees are usually like 5 to 10% of the overall assets in the estate. Um, so what would happen is you'd have 5 to 10% in one state and 5 to 10% in another state, and it just adds up and eats away at your overall assets that you have. So a will is a good tool to have, but it's a good tool to have as a complete package for the overall estate plan. It's not a good tool to have by itself because like I said, it's just instructions for the court. It just, I mean, you still have to go through probate, which is, can be a nightmare. Um, so, and then the safe deposit box, the reason that I said that sometimes I don't like those necessarily is because in Ohio, when I would do probate, I've had a couple of safe deposit boxes that the will was in the safe deposit box. So then I have to go through the probate court. And what they do in Ohio is they appoint someone to access the safe deposit box and inventory it. And usually it's either the uh, it's either someone from the court or the attorney. So I had to drive out to the bank get in the safe deposit box, take an inventory of everything, turn it over to the court and let them know. And then from there, we could actually start the probate process. So if you have a safe deposit box and you have some valuable items that you might not want the court to know about, then I had to show them everything that was in the safe deposit box. Um, and banks will not let, if someone else is, if your name's not on the safe deposit box, banks are very, most banks will not let anyone get in it. So once the person whose name is on it passed away, the bank won't let anyone in. So if you do want to have a safe deposit box, make sure someone else has their name on it as well. So that that situation doesn't come up where your name's the only one on it, you pass away. Now the bank's going to shut that box down. No one's going to be allowed to access it until there's a court order allowing for access. And I don't know about, like, I'm assuming since people enjoy the anonymity that they don't want court involvement, we want the court to be involved as little as possible. And as someone who has been the attorney on that end, I think it's a good idea to involve the court as little as possible in an estate because it just, the court wants everything 
the attorneys want to keep track of everything so they can figure out so they can increase their payout. The court will drag it out. You have to get everything approved before you can transfer it. And it just, it takes months and months. It's, I mean, it's not a bad gig if you're the attorney. That's why I used to do, I mean, it's not a lot of work, but it's a lot of money. So the attorneys involved in probate usually are making a lot of money and not doing a lot of work. So next would be another good thing to have is that letter of instruction. So the letter of instruction, you would want to like kind of outline your, your bills that need to be paid. I think it's a good idea that I used to tell people to do like a spreadsheet and you can list all of your assets as well on the spreadsheet and just let your kids know that, or whoever's next in line that you have a spreadsheet that outlines it all. That way they can get on. It has like the account number and the institution. They can contact them, let them know you passed away. What did I need to do? And if it's one with like a beneficiary designation, like payable on death, transferable on death, they're going to need to send your death certificate, fill out some forms, and the funds can be accessed immediately after the death certificate and everything is turned in. So it's a good idea, I think, to put like a spreadsheet together, have your passwords because stuff so much stuff is done online. Same thing for like social media that you have so that they can put it in legacy mode or whatever they need to do so that there's not just like a Facebook page lingering out there for someone who passed away. Um, and that can be a little bit weird. Um, bills, uh, who to notify if you have like a pension or any sort of retirement, who that's through so they can notify them. Um, just stuff like that on your letter of instruction. You can also put on the letter of instruction, like what your wishes are for burial, funeral, that type of stuff. If you want to let, if you don't like prepay for that and you want to let the person know what to do. That's another good thing to have on the letter of instruction. And then the last thing is going to be a living will. So the living will is going to be very, very important, I think, because it allows control from the grave so that you avoid that 58 to 60 days and everything's gone. You can put some, I like to call them speed bumps in place to kind of protect the people inheriting. You avoid the probate process. Another thing with like blended families and unmarried couples would be you can take care of each other. So you can create it together. And then if you pass away, it can take care of your partner, your significant other, your spouse, if you're a blended family, while not excluding your kids. So you can have it where it takes care of your spouse and then whatever's left can still go to like your kids. So say you're from a blended family and you had kids and he had kids and you guys got married, but you both want, you want to make sure that you can keep up the lifestyle that you had. You don't want your spouse to like become a ward of the state or not be able to afford anything. Um, but you don't want to exclude your kids. You don't want your spouse to just uh, take everything and pass it to their kids. Well, if you do a living trust, it can be, it's for both of your benefit while you're living, then it's for the survivor's benefit, so your spouse. But then once your spouse passes or your partner, um, significant other, whatever, then it passes down to your children. And you can write that in there so that it doesn't all end up, so they can't take it and just spend, give it to their kids. That can all be done within a living trust. So it's a way to keep up the lifestyle and take care of each other while also saving stuff for the kids. It's a way to have the speed bumps, the control from the grave. It's a way to keep that anonymity because the probate court's not involved. And then doing trust administration. So if you needed to hire an attorney to assist you with trust administration, um, the fees, so probate's five to 10%. Trust administration, we charged one and a half percent is what I charged, but the fee is somewhere between one and two and a half. So it's a lot lower percentage. And then the time frame, instead of being six to 30 months, it's about six to 10 weeks to get everything done, split up. 
and figure it out. So it's a lot faster process. It's a lot smoother process for everyone. And it can work really well. Um, another thing that you can do to avoid the probate process is check the ownership and how beneficiary designations are. So like life insurance, you have a beneficiary designation. If you have a trust, you can make that the trust or you can have it be kids. I tell people you can also have it be uh, like if you had charitable interest, then you can have beneficiary designation as a charitable interest. Um, bank accounts as well. Most people don't know this. I know in Ohio it's this way, and there's a lot of states that it's this way. You can make a car transferable on death as well so that it doesn't go through the probate process. That would be especially important if you're not married. In Ohio, your spouse can uh, get a vehicle without going through probate. They can get up to $80,000 worth of vehicles without going through probate. But if you're an unmarried couple, then you can always put your partner or your significant other as transferable in death, and they would still avoid probate, and the vehicle can be transferred. Um, so there's retirement accounts, investment accounts, have beneficiaries, bank accounts. You can make it payable in death, which is a beneficiary. Um, you can check with your pension plans and retirement plans as well and see what you can do. Um, you can also have your significant other be an outright owner of something with you. Um, that way, when you pass away, they just become the full owner of it. That's an option as well to avoid the probate process. But basically, the moral of this is there's lots of ways to go about it, but avoiding the probate process is probably in everyone's best interest, especially if you have real estate in multiple states um, or you enjoy the anonymity of, say, our structures that we do here at Royal Legal, or you just don't want to give 5 to 10% of the value of an estate to an attorney. So, because I've had, I mean, I've had probate at my old firm. I've had estates where it was $25,000 is what they had to pay us in legal fees, $25,000, uh, $30,000 in legal fees. So it can add up very quickly. Um, so that's pretty much what I had there. So what I'll do is I'll look at the chat and kind of answer any questions, and then I can open it up to if anyone has any additional questions. So 